All right, so uh, hopefully things are going well so far and as we start winding down the semester, remember it's really important to stay focused for these last several weeks in all your classes, finish strong. Um, so today we're going to spend some time talking about a, a, a really broad topic, um, ecosystems and different biological aspects of the, the earth. And so we're going to cover a, a lot of topics today. So as always, it's important to do some definitions, make sure we're all clear on the language. And when we're looking at ecology, which is the study of um, ecosystems, or the study, it's literally sort of the study of your house. And so, you know, of course, the earth is our home. The earth is home to everything that's alive here on the planet. And so ecology is the study of the house or the home of living things, what we also refer to as, uh, as ecosystems. So kind of look at different scales that we're studying. There are biologists or ecologists who study entire ecosystems, which consists of the community and the physical environment. And so the physical environment, the community would be living things and the physical environment would be all the other aspects of that ecosystem that are not alive. So the water itself, how water moves through the environment, um, the soil, all the minerals and elements, rocks, uh, air, weather patterns, you know, rainfall, precipitation, etc. And so then the community are all of the populations of living things that live in the same place at the same time. And those living things all interact with each other. Some are predators of, of others. Some are the prey. Some uh, ultimately compete with each other for, for all the resources they need. And so this image of, of this little diverse tidal pool would be a community. And so all those different species, there are at least, uh, what, two, uh, maybe three different species of starfish, anemones, um, probably some little crabs and other crustaceans in there. All of those living things are a community. They're all in the same place at the same time, and they interact with each other to, to one degree or another. When you add that community to all of the other physical attributes of that region, that tidal pool or that seashore, and again, you're looking at the tides that go up and down, the weather patterns, all those other things then combined uh, make up the entire community. When we look at ecosystems uh, and, and even many ecosystems over the surface of the earth, we generally break them down into groups that are based on the temperature of, of an area, the precipitation, which could be rain or snow, and then um, also the latitude plays in, how far north or south you are from the equator. And so um, in, from, a, from a broad ecological sense, we use the system represented here within the triangle. So again, biomes are, are pretty large regions that are distinct with respect to those three factors, basically. And then certainly each of those biomes from the tropical rainforests through the deserts and the temperate rainforest and the boreal forest and the tundra all um, are, are unique in a lot of respects, but, but specifically they're also unique with respect to the types of soils they have, which then dictates the types of plants that exist and therefore the types of animals as well. So each of these biomes um, have evolved to be what they are and they all contain their own suite of, of living things that, that tend to be unique or, or more abundant within uh, each of these biomes. <clears throat> so again, notice on the, um, 
uh, the triangle, the bottom goes from very wet to drier habitats. So the tropical rainforest is at the very far left. And you probably know by the name, if nothing else, that these are very wet habitats. 100 plus to 200 inches of rainfall um, per year. As we move on the left side of the triangle from very hot to very cold climates, and on the right side from the tropics, in other words, near the equator to the, um, the North Pole or towards the South Pole, I guess it could work the same way, um, you see at the very top you have the tundra. So right before you get to the areas that are completely snow covered and virtually nothing but snow, you have the tundra, which exists across the northern parts of Canada and Alaska, and then, of course, the very northern part of Europe and, and the Asian continent. As you look around the planet, um, we'll look at a, a map of the world in a minute. And you'll see some trends with respect to where these different biomes occur. But even keep in mind that when you're talking about one biome that people typically um, would think of as a desert, for example, um, there are things that all deserts have in common with each other, and that's typically um, a certain amount of rainfall, precipitation per year. And again, I, I really should have said precipitation because even deserts do get snow at, in, in addition to possibly a little bit of rain. But even, uh, even though maybe you have a desert biome, not all deserts are identical. You have the Sonoran Desert um, represented on the left side of the slide by the Saguaro National Park in uh, kind of south central Arizona. And they're really diverse communities. I mean, they have a lot of cacti and, and prickly and pokey kind of plants in them. Um, you know, lots of reptiles like, like a lot of different species of snakes, lizards, um, and, they, and they're, they're relatively dry. But um, they also have a lot of diversity in them, and they can get a fair amount of precipitation, either as rain or snow. At least a fair amount when you compare it to something like the Boa Vista Island in the, um, the, the southern part of Africa, which is basically devoid of life, other than probably bacteria that are in the soil. And it may not even rain uh, for several years or, or, or longer, just kind of depends. So even deserts can vary greatly from getting almost no rainfall over the course of years to other deserts, including some that we have in California, um, that, that actually do get, you know, a a little bit of rain, enough to grow lots of different things, more than you might typically think of with a desert. And so all of these different living things that exist in these biomes are, again, interacting with each other, living things that make up communities that interact with each other. And basically these living things make up what are called food webs, which are a whole bunch of what are called food chains. So a food chain is a um, sort of a, you think of a chain, right? We all know what a chain looks like. It's got a bunch of different links that make up however long the chain is. And so in an ecosystem, each of those links would be a species. So in the Sonoran Desert, for example, um, I, I'd lived in southern Arizona for a couple years and had a chance to really uh, appreciate the, the Sonoran Desert. And so a, a food chain in, in that desert could be um, a grass plant that provides seeds. So the plant, the grass, would be one link. Uh, a link that's attached to it could be something like a kangaroo rat. And those kangaroo rat eat the seeds of the grass plants. So that's a second link. A third link that's connected to the kangaroo rat side might be something like a coyote. A predator of that um, of that kangaroo rat, and then um, you could have other links on the chains 
there aren't probably a lot of um, species that would live off of eating coyotes, but if the coyote dies, which everything does eventually, right, you're going to have other things like the turkey vultures um, that would scavenge, you know, anything that dies. But just think of that one food chain that's grass, kangaroo rat, and coyote. That's only one food chain. Now you could have another food chain that's um, a, 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 a plant, some kind of brush that's eaten by the, the antelope. And then that antelope could be eaten by the mountain lion. And so that's another food chain. When you add all those food chains together, you then create a food web. So each of the food chains are, are kind of a linear uh, depiction of how energy moves through that ecosystem. Grass, kangaroo rat, coyote, grass, kangaroo rat, bobcat, kangaroo rat, bobcat, and, uh, and all those other possible food chains, all of the living things and how they interact with each other is depicted by these food chains. But then, of course, those are not um, completely distinct from each other, right? The kangaroo rat might be food for a few different species of rattlesnakes, for the bobcat, like I mentioned, the coyote. Uh, other things might also, hawks and owls might also eat that kangaroo rat. So when you add all of those pieces together, then you're developing this, this food web. And really, again, the point of that is to show how energy moves through the environment, how energy flows in one direction from the producers, which are the plants, through any number of consumers, like kangaroo rat, coyote. And so we can depict that um, in a few different ways. One of the ways we might show those types of food chains would be what we call a, a pyramid. And this would be, for example, like a, a pyramid that shows uh, the amount or biomass of living things. Notice these, these food chains, or, or when we depict them like a pyramid, it literally has to be a pyramid that has a wide base and it tapers upward. Um, let me see here, sorry. So um, notice that the producers, or in this case, the grass, we need 10,000 units of that grass to provide 10 units or pounds or kilograms or measurement unit doesn't really matter, but it's, it's the, uh, the amount, whether you want to measure it in calories or, or weight, you know, biomass. So for every 10,000 units of grass, it, it takes to make 10 units of field mouse, and those 10 units of mouse are required to make one unit of, of a bird of prey. So in this case, you've got a marsh hawk that feeds on field mice. And so ultimately, that means that marsh hawk, which is a secondary consumer, a second level consumer, ultimately needs 10,000 units of grass to make enough mice for it to survive. And again, this is all about, about energy. You know, you need um, a lot of energy at each of the levels to provide enough food for the next level. And notice, at, at best, we're talking about you need 10 times as much food at the next level, right? For every one hawk, you need 10 times uh, the units of mouse. And then actually for the mice, it takes uh, 100 times that value in food. So generally speaking, although again, it depends on the ecosystem and, and the food chains and all that, but we, we kind of typically say that it's um, like, like a power of 10, that for every trophic level you go up from, from producers to consumers and so on, you need at least 10 times the units of energy at the next level, and sometimes even more, as you can see going from the mouse to the grass. So there, there's a lot really going on on this fairly simple slide. It's showing 
uh, in this case, number of individuals, but again, it could be weight or anything. It's talking about trophic levels, feeding levels, and those feeding levels consist of the producers, which are always the plants, and then there can be primary consumers, the first trophic level that feeds on the producer. And then if there's a, something that eats the primary consumer, that would be called the secondary consumer, in this case, the bird of prey. Um, you can have third level consumers, fourth level consumers, uh, it just totally depends on the ecosystem. In general, the more diverse the ecosystem is, the longer the food chains are going to be. If you have a really dry desert, you might only have three links like this image, a hawk, a mouse, and grass. But if you're in the tropical rainforest somewhere in Brazil in South America, you might have five, six, seven links, plants that are eaten by, say, insects that are eaten by bigger insects. Those bigger insects might be eaten by um, maybe a small bird. That small bird might be eaten by, uh, by some kind of reptile, or maybe just the egg of the bird is eaten by some kind of reptile. You could have a larger snake that eats the, the reptile, the other kind of reptile, lizard. And then you could have a, um, some kind of predatory bird that eats the snake. And, and you could even have a bigger predatory bird that eats the other bird. But again, you, you need to have a really diverse, productive ecosystem to have longer food chains. And again, those, those more productive ecosystems are always going to be things like tropical rainforests or coral reefs in the ocean. Here's, a, again, an example of a, of a food chain. Uh, and it shows the trophic levels. This is a, a real food chain in Lake Ontario. So kind of the, the uh, you know, upper Midwest, more towards the east of the Midwest, along the Canadian border. And again, you have, in this case, the producers are green algae, which we were actually talking about this week in uh, lab. Mollusks like snails move around on the rocks, and they feed on the algae that grows on the rocks. And then you have a smaller fish that's going to feed on those snails. And then ultimately a larger fish like a Chinook salmon that eats those slimy sculpins. Um, and again, in this case, you have a tertiary consumer, a third level consumer, or what we also refer to as an apex predator. Basically, that apex predator is always going to be the thing at the very top of the food chain. In other words, there's nothing that's going to eat that apex predator. Now again, when that predator dies, then it can certainly be scavenged by other things, but when it's alive, there's nothing that's going to eat it. Now, if this was a Chinook salmon that, that migrated to the ocean, um, then certainly, you know, it could have other predators, a fourth level predator like a shark or a seal or any number of larger um, fish that could eat that Chinook. But in this case, it's a, an interior lake, and so we've got these four levels. Again, from an ecological standpoint, one of the more useful things, again, goes back to energy, the relative amount of energy available within the different trophic levels in an ecosystem. And the amount of energy basically tells us how productive the ecosystem is, how much life it can support. And so um, in this case, it's showing um, uh, the relative energy in different trophic levels within a, um, a Florida ecosystem, where again, the producers, the primary uh, producers are listed there from diatoms, which we also looked at in lab this week, to various aquatic plants. And you can see the energy content measured in kilocalories per square meter per year. In this ecosystem, they measured uh, that to be 20,000 kilocalories per square meter per year that's being produced or generated by that environment. And that in turn is enough energy, enough food to provide what roughly 
3,500 kilocalories per meter squared per year of primary consumers like the red-bellied turtle, um, snails, small fish, predatory insects like the midge larva. That in turn can provide enough energy for those secondary consumers and then that in turn provides enough energy for those third level consumers that are listed there. But again, notice how much energy it takes at the producer level to produce or have enough food to make a, a few third level consumers. There probably isn't enough energy left in this environment for there to be a fourth level consumer. There isn't enough energy left in bass and gar and water snakes for other living things to be able to exist on. Now again, in Florida, there could be alligators, right? So would an alligator eat um, a bass if it could? Well, of course it would. Um, but in this particular ecosystem, there isn't enough energy to support alligators. Now, again, there are alligators in Florida and they exist, they're abundant in other areas. But in this area, there isn't enough production to support a fourth level consumer like an alligator um, or some other larger predator. So again, it tells us how much energy there is available and then that available energy can dictate how long the food chains can be. The more energy available at the producer level, the longer the food chains can be. And not only that, the more complex the food web can be if there's more energy at the producer level. So here's a, a little more realistic food web. Now again, this isn't even anywhere near a complete food web. But for uh, an ecosystem, you can see we've got um, the, the plant material, and, that, and that's I'm trying to figure out why my there we go, I guess. I'll go down here. Sorry, we're having technical difficulties here. All right, so um, you see this layer is the primary producer layer. And so these are all the plants, grasses, shrubs, plants that uh, photosynthesize. And then you see the area where you have the primary consumers, those species that directly eat the plant material. Now, some of these are food items for um, some secondary consumers. And again, notice in this case, the fox not only might eat the squirrel, but it might also eat the mouse. The owl uh, would feed on squirrels as well as mice but also um, smaller sized birds, including the robin or the sparrows. Um, the, the snake would also fit in that category, right? But on the other side of this food web, you go from a, um, a, the producer la layer to a primary consumer, to a secondary consumer, to a third level consumer, to a fourth level consumer. So even within that ecosystem, um, you in this ecosystem, we've got fourth level consumers. Um, and we also have third level consumers that, that feed or fit into a different part of that food web. But then also very importantly, notice at the very bottom here, you have the group of uh, the trophic level that's called the decomposers. Fungi like mushrooms break down organic matter that's already dead and kind of help recycle it back into the soil so that it can feed the plants that ultimately feed the animals. 
So whether you have microscopic organisms like nematodes or earthworms that burrow their way through the soil and, and eat organic matter, um, that's a, a really important part of this whole food web. Because if you didn't have the decomposers, which again also could include coyote, you know, that'll scavenge something that's dead, um, vultures, you wouldn't be able to recycle that energy. And if you can't recycle that energy, um, you, you basically have no way to put it back as food for the plants, the producers. So we've used some terminology, producers that are the plants that make their own energy. They produce their own energy. We have consumers and we can have primary, secondary, tertiary, fourth, fifth level consumers that eat the producers. We talked about the decomposers that break down the dead organic matter. Um, but then we also have some other terminology. Photoautotroph is still basically um, plants, which again are producers. Um, it's just another more specific term that we use when we're referring to the plants, the producers in an environment, because those producers can be photoautotrophs using light to make their own energy, or they can actually be in some environments chemoautotrophs. So these could be things like bacteria that live in the mud pots. For those of you that have ever been to Lassen National Park or um, Yellowstone, there are those mud pots or those really pretty clear pools of water that have all the really interesting colors around them. All those different colors are different types of bacteria, different species of archibacteria. And those bacteria don't use the sunlight to make their energy. They use chemicals that are in the water or in the soil to make their own energy. And then those would be the producers that provide the food for anything else uh, above them on the food chain. So again, the, the producers can be either photoautotrophs or chemoautotrophs. The orangish rusty looking color on these rocks is actually down at the very bottom of, of an ocean and you have areas on the bottom of the ocean where there are vents that open up that allow uh, you know superheated water to escape and um, you get down deep enough of course and there's no sunlight maybe you go down five six thousand feet to the bottom of the ocean there's no sunlight so plants can't photosynthesize, but bacteria that have evolved to feed on the minerals that are floating around down there um, make energy and then again those are the food source for those deep ocean uh, areas that provide food for a whole little ecosystem that uh, you know we didn't even know existed until we had the technology to go that deep into the ocean. Notice when you get down that deep, all of these different living things are basically a couple of things. Well, you can see that, that all of the, the shrimp and the little crustaceans and, um, you know, in other words, crabs and lobster and, and even some of the fish, they're all sort of albino. Because again, if you're 5,000 feet down in the ocean, there's no light. So there's no color, basically. There's no value, no benefit of being colorful. But the other thing that you can't see is, is many of these species have evolved um, in a way that they have lost their eyesight. Again, you don't need to see, you can't see when it's pitch black all the time. So they've evolved other senses, the whiskers and feelers that different things have help them interact with their environment. Uh, again, this one is at the peak of a, of a under the ocean volcano that's really active, 1,500 meters, 
which is close to 5,000 feet, roughly a mile down. But, uh, but again, it's the, um, those chemoautotrophs that provide the equivalent to, say, the grass on the surface of the earth. And all those other organisms you see down there ultimately depend on those chemoautotrophs for them to be able to exist in this uh, deep ocean environment. So going back to the idea of, um, of energy and the value of energy, again, something that ecologists always study uh, is the productivity of an ecosystem, how productive it is. And we measure that typically as the net primary productivity, which is also related to the gross primary productivity. The net primary productivity, the book defines it as the amount of biomass. And so biomass is just the, the weight of all of the life, the plants, the animals, that are found in excess of what is actually lost through respiration. Now, I'll, I'll try to explain that a little better in just a second. And then the gross primary productivity is the rate that energy is captured. So when you, um, when you go to work and you're earning $20 an hour and you work 10 hours a week, your gross pay is $200 a week, right? That's how much your number of hours multiplied by your hourly rate is your gross pay. So in an ecosystem, you've got certain amount of sunlight coming down, you have the maximum ability of plants to capture that sunlight and grow, grow new roots, grow new leaves, make flowers, make seeds, reproduce, make more copies of themselves. The net primary productivity then is, is all the energy that can be captured by the plants, but Remember, some parts of the plants aren't edible, for example, trees. There are sometimes living things that eat the bark of a tree, but usually it's not because they want to. It's because that's the only food they can find. Deer will eat bark, but it's generally only if they're starving to death. So the actual wood of the tree, most of that's not edible, although there are wood-boring insects that'll bore their way just under the bark. So there are parts of every plant that living things eat, but also parts of the plant that aren't eaten. So part of those plants that aren't eaten are, are, are lost from the gross amount of energy that's being put into that plant growing. Plus that plant does respire, just like if we're outside in Reading in the middle of the summer and we're you know, being a little active, and we're burning calories, right? So we have to keep taking in energy to make up for the calories we burn. And then especially reading in the summertime, we're sweating. So we have to take water in to make up for all the sweat that we're losing through, um, through the evaporation process. So plants also have to work, right, to, to do their thing. And so they sometimes, if it's too hot, they, they'll lose excess moisture. They have to work harder to, to stay you know, alive and productive. Um, and so the net primary productivity is for plants is kind of like your net pay. Again, 20 bucks an hour, 10 hours a week, $200 gross pay. But unless you're just kind of working for cash, you know, doing a, doing a job where you're working for cash, and you choose not to report that income, if you work, you know, say as a, a tutor and you're earning 10 bucks an hour for 10 hours a week, you have to pay taxes on that money. Um, and so then you get the taxes deducted, state tax, federal tax, social security, Medicare, whatever, and you're left with your net pay. After you've paid all of your taxes, then you have what's left over that you can use to do whatever you want with it. So it works exactly the same for plants. <clears throat> and 
And then if we look at the estimated net primary productivity in, in the main biomes, what we see are that the deserts, especially the extreme deserts that are mostly rock or sand or ice, um, have very low primary or net primary productivity. The, the deserts and semi-desert scrubs, a little more productive. The open ocean, now again, there are different places within the ocean, but the ocean, in this case, the third item up from the bottom, is referring to just kind of the open water away from the land. Very low productivity. And then we move through the tundra, lakes and streams, grasslands, ag land, and we go all the way up to the top. And tropical rainforests are, are near the top, but they're actually not even as productive as coral reefs and algae beds that have an even higher net primary productivity. And so again, those biomes, those ecosystems that have greater productivity can support a lot more diversity, a lot more different living things, species diversity, but they can also support higher numbers of living things. So again, the more productive an ecosystem is, the more diverse it is, and the more biomass that can be produced in those ecosystems. So for example, uh, a, a type of quiz question, it's not going to ask you, um, you know, what's the number of grams per square meter per year productivity of a savanna? But a question might be, you know, which of the following are, are the most productive? And so there could be a multiple choice, you know, lake streams, ag land, savanna, or estuaries, which is the most productive. So you should have a sense of the relative productivity of these different ecosystems. <clears throat> There's another factor that is, is a very important aspect of understanding ecosystems. And that has to do with food chains, um, but also more specifically the ability of certain things, chemicals, to be able to move through a food chain or through a food web. And so biomagnification bio is basically where you have the concentration of a chemical. In the case of this slide, it's showing uh, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, and the ability of a chemical like that to get more and more concentrated as you move from the producers, in this case up to the walleye, which is a, um, you know, a top level consumer, a probably at least um, um, a, a third level consumer within ecosystems where that fish exists in fresh water. We um, in the past have, have used a lot of different chemicals to make things in, in the manufacturing process. PCBs are kind of byproducts of, of a lot of processes that make things like plastic, for example. And so what has happened in the past, before we understood the idea of biomagnification, or the even not even understanding PCBs at the time, but certain chemicals like PCBs accumulate in fatty tissue. They're not water soluble. If they were water soluble, they'd just dissolve and go away. But they're actually fat soluble. So when the, the phytoplankton is, you know, filtering water, it's, it's taking in very small amounts of, of PCBs that are in the water from things that humans have done. Again, the byproduct of making stuff. So there are lots of phytoplankton, right? That's the, the bottom of the food pyramid. But then you have zebra mussels that eat phytoplankton. They don't just eat a phytoplankton here and there. They eat thousands of them over the course of their lifetime. And so every one of those little phytoplankton has a very, very small concentration of PCBs. But when you add up all of those tiny little bits, 
and you concentrate them in the zebra muscle, now you've increased the volume or, or amount of that PCB. And so every time you go um, from one link to another link in the food chain, you're concentrating all of the PCBs that are taken in by the previous trophic level. In this case, you get to the top of the food chain, like the walleye, and now you have a, a high enough concentration that it can actually start causing trouble. In this country, one of the, the biggest problems, or, or I guess it was a big enough concern that we started really wondering uh, what impact things like the PCBs or in the case of the bald eagle, it was actually, does anybody know a chemical was causing problems with bald eagles decades ago? DDT, right? We made DDT to help us with the war, you know, kill plants so that um, we would kill disease bearing organisms like mosquitoes so that our troops wouldn't catch diseases that we basically didn't have much immunity to. And then as soon as we figured out how good it worked, we started spraying all over the place in this country to kill mosquitoes so that we didn't have problems with diseases like malaria. And so we would just literally drive through towns and spray DDT, which also exposed us directly to it. But the DDT would, would settle in the soil. It would be transferred into the lakes and streams and rivers. And then in the lakes, streams, and rivers, it would basically work just like what we see here. It would get concentrated and magnified up the food chain until it got to the fish, the larger fish that the eagles would eat. Again, you can see all these fish carcasses scattered around the, the eagle nest here. So every one of those fish now could have a pretty high concentration of DDT. And then when the eagle eats the fish or feeds it to their young, it didn't actually kill the eagles. And again, I imagine a lot of you, if not all of you, are familiar with exactly what was happening here. Remember, it wasn't that the DDT killed the eagles, but the DDT would affect the ability of the eagle to metabolize calcium and what are eggs made out of, eggshells are made out of calcium, right? So because the eagles weren't producing strong shells, they would lay eggs and then just by sitting on them, trying to hatch them, a lot of times the, the, the eggs would just break under the weight of the parent. And so it wasn't killing the adults, but basically the eagles weren't able to make babies. And eventually, you know, the eagle would get older and older and, and then would, would die. But you might have generations of not being able to make new babies. And so, of course, when you don't replace young with the individuals that are dying, the population starts to drop off, which can lead in almost did lead to extinction. Again, we finally sort of saw there was a problem with eagles and, and other things like osprey. Peregrine falcon were, were kind of a, a similar bird that was having that problem. And um, eventually we <clears throat> identified what the, what the issue was, DDT, or in the case of other fish, it might have been the PCBs. I, I grew up in Wisconsin, right on Lake Michigan, and when I was growing up in the 70s um, and I would go fishing, there always at that time were advisories. You were not supposed to eat more than, I think it was something like a pound of salmon per week. Because again, in that ecosystem, salmon were at the very top of the food chain. And we had at that point identified the PCB concentrations were really high in Lake Michigan because of all the industry. And when you get to a really big old salmon that has been alive for maybe 15 or more years, uh, it's, it's had 15 or more years to concentrate PCBs to the point 
that if, if humans would eat too much of it, we were worried about the types of health problems that it could cause, having figured out that we were having similar problems with things like bald eagles. So we didn't fully understand what types of problems that, that it could cause in humans, but we knew that it was causing problems in other things. And so then once we figured out that there was a problem, then it was, well, how do we solve this problem? Obviously, the, the main thing is to stop making the problem, right? Stop creating PCBs and dumping them in lakes. Stop using DDT for um, killing mosquitoes. But also because those chemicals are so persistent, they don't just go away. Ultimately, we had to just kind of wait it out until the, the chemicals eventually worked their way out of the environment after maybe several decades. In the meanwhile, to save the eagle, we had to, um, you know, kind of monitor nests, take the eggs away from the parents before the eggs broke, and then hatch those eggs in an incubator, and then put them with foster parents after they hatched. So basically, we had to jump in there and not let the adults hatch their own eggs for fear that they would all break. Just final thought on that, to, to point out just how pervasive those chemicals are. We haven't been able to legally use DDT in the United States for decades now. So it's been decades since we've used, theoretically used DDT in, in the US. But in, in recent years, we've actually been finding it in the Columbia River system on the Oregon-Washington uh, border. We're also still finding it in the Catalina Islands. Eagles that are um, living in that ecosystem um, are still um, found to have very high concentrations of DDT. So... We stopped using it long enough ago that it shouldn't still be showing up in the environment. The problem is, even though we don't use it, we still make it. And if we make it, that means we sell it. And so who do you think we might sell it to? Well, we've got a, um, a neighbor to the south that we still sell DDT to. And so if, if our neighbors to the south are using it, it can obviously very easily get into the rivers and oceans, and Southern California is obviously right there. So even though we're not legally using it anymore, we still make it, which again, if you think about that, if we're so worried about the effects of DDT, why the hell would we still even make the stuff, much less sell it to anyone else? But now we get into something maybe a little more political. Um, but so these chemicals that we've slowly figured out are problems, we've phased them out, um, but they still continue to cause problems even decades after we've quit using them. So understanding biomagnification means that we have to understand biogeochemical cycles. There's the big word for the day, bio meaning biological, Geo meaning geological, as in processes like soil formation, you know, how rocks and, and uh, soil, uh, how rocks, um, you know, decompose to become soil and all those geological processes and chemical processes. And so how these different chemicals cycle through our environments. Remember, it's important to... To, to keep in, in perspective that energy flows in one direction through our environments. So energy from the sun allows plants to grow. Those plants are eaten by different consumers. And then eventually that energy is just no longer concentrated enough. That, again, that's why, you know, the pyramid's wide at the base and it tapers up and eventually there's just not enough energy left to make another trophic level or another link in the chain. But, but matter or things like nutrients 
cycle through an environment. They cycle with the help of, for example, the decomposers that I spoke about. When living things die, all the matter that's in those living things, all the elements and things we might call nutrients get broken down from, you know, the whole living thing to the tissues to carbon and nitrogen and and those are then released back to the environment where they can be reused again. So that matter is constantly cycling, whereas the energy flows one direction from the sun through living things, and ultimately it's, it's lost as heat, which is energy, but, but heat is energy that's not strong enough to do any more work. So... Um, there's several biogeochemical cycles that we'll talk about. And I just want to focus on um, what, the, um, what the thing is. What the, so, for example, we're going to talk about the water cycle first, the hydrologic cycle. And then kind of how it flows or cycles, I should say, and uh, what the sources are. So on the Earth, we obviously have salt water which is almost 98% of all of the water that's on the planet. And then the fresh water, which is only about 2.5% of all of the water on the planet. Obviously, <clears throat> living things, unless you're a saltwater species, need fresh water. So of that, two and a half percent of all of the water on the planet that's fresh water most of it most of that fresh water is actually in snow or glaciers or, or or ice in other words it's in a form that isn't accessible you can't drink um snow you can't eat ice i mean as far as it providing you with water that your body needs to sustain itself. About a third of it then, less than a third of, of the fresh water, is actually in groundwater. So it could be the moisture that's in the soil, the water that's down, um, you know, down below the soil, or, or swamps, the permafrost that's, you know, frozen water that's in the soil. And only 0.3% of the 2.5% of all of the water on the planet is found in lakes and rivers. Fresh water that's in lakes and rivers, streams, all that would fit into this category. So again, it, it's a very, very small amount of all of the water on the planet that is actually available as fresh water. Most of it's in the oceans. So here's a diagram um, that shows the water cycle. And so you have sources, back up to this. Um, you have uh, the initial sources of the water, which are in the oceans, uh, lakes, streams, and rivers. You also have water that's stored in the soil. So the underground uh, water. Again, you have all of the water that's in a frozen format, ice and snow, glaciers. And so ultimately what happens is the frozen precipitation melts, maybe not all of it, but at least partially, or over tens of thousands of years it melts, and then it accumulates and it melts some of that water runs off and it goes into the uh, lakes, streams, and rivers, flows across the surface. Some of it uh, melts and it just percolates into the soil or what we, through the process we call infiltration. When it's underground moving through the soil, it then can also seep out as a spring it can seep out into the lake streams, rivers, but eventually all of it, whether it's in the rivers and streams, whether it's in the soil, 
eventually it ends up finding its way into the ocean. It can actually circulate around the ocean for thousands and thousands of years, but eventually that water then evaporates off the surface of the water. And again, it's going to do that from the ocean. It's going to do that from lakes, streams, and rivers. And then that condensation, that water vapor, eventually accumulates in the atmosphere. And when enough of those water molecules all kind of bind together, they form clouds, which are just water vapor that we can see. And when it gets heavy enough, it actually falls back out of the atmosphere as rain or snow. And so again, this is just a constant cycle of water moving from the atmosphere to the surface of the earth as snow or, or liquid precipitation, moving across the surface into the waterways, and then eventually evaporating back to the surface, uh, to, the, to the atmosphere. But then also remember, you've got the plants and the animals. When we sweat in Reading in the, in the summertime, we're basically having water that evaporates off of our skin and goes back as water vapor. Or when it's a plant, it's called evapotranspiration. So again, that's a process basically of, of um, the cyclic movement of water from uh, different places on the surface of the earth. Since we're carbon-based life forms, carbon is also a, uh, an important uh, cycle to understand. The source of carbon uh, is the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, the CO2. I'm trying to draw with my mouse, so that's readable, I guess. But so the, all of the carbon on this planet that is used to build us, plants, bacteria, comes from the carbon dioxide that's in our atmosphere. The way it gets into us is through the process of respiration. Remember, think back earlier in the semester, we talked about the, um, the, the process of photosynthesis, right? And one of the important things that, that plants need is CO2. And it's because they need that carbon to build the glucose molecules that then provide us with food. We break those sugar molecules down through the process of respiration. And so when we exhale, what do we give off, right? CO2. So the CO2 is needed for photosynthesis. And then we put it back in the atmosphere as we respire. Remember the same exact thing is happening in the oceans, whether you're talking about life on the earth surface or in the oceans, lakes, streams, rivers, same process is happening. Same process is also happening in the soil with um, microscopic organisms that are respiring and, and breaking down organic matter, giving off CO2. The process of, um, of of plants decomposing gives off methane, CH4. Um, and then also really importantly, because of how abundant we are on the planet, we create a lot of carbon emissions by burning fossil fuels, by driving our automobiles. And so that's adding a lot of CO2 back to the atmosphere. Now, Normally, cycles are balanced. The, um, the water that's in the atmosphere is kind of balanced out by the water that's in the soil and the oceans, etc. And it would be the same thing with the carbon cycle. The CO2 that's in the atmosphere is being stored there, and then it's being used and recycled back into the atmosphere. The reason that it's really important for scientists to understand the carbon cycle is mostly because of, let me erase this again, because of this part of the cycle. The fact that we are digging out 
so much fossilized carbon, in other words, petroleum, natural gas, coal, and these are meant to be long-term storage, like storage that should be there for millions of years, tens of millions of years. And we're digging it out of the ground. We're burning it to make electricity and everything else. And then we're making so much emissions back up to the atmosphere that we're actually throwing the carbon cycle out of balance. And all of that CO2 that's in the atmosphere is creating the greenhouse effect or in general the idea of, of uh, global warming or climate change. Again, we'll talk a little more about that uh, in, in a later chapter, but the primary reason for that is because of us throwing the carbon cycle out of balance. All right, then we have the nitrogen cycle. Again, the source of nitrogen is the uh, nitrogen gas that's in the atmosphere. The way that it gets into the Earth ecosystem is by a process called nitrogen fixation. Bacteria do that. Um, certain plants do it. Plants we call nitrogen fixers. Plants that are in the category of things like beans, peas, plants that we call legumes, in other words. Um, and so those are a special kind of plant that have the ability to grab that nitrogen out of the atmosphere and convert it into a type of nitrogen, ultimately, that other plants can use. When you fertilize your uh, garden, you fertilize it with a, with a type of fertilizer that has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in it, primarily. Uh, so again, plants need those, those elements to build roots, leaves, flowers, seeds, fruits. And so the only way that nitrogen um, is able to get into the, excuse me here, into the plants is because of the ability of specific bacteria and specific types of plants to convert it into a type of nitrogen that can be used by all the other plants. Those plants then are eaten by uh, other things in the food webs and then when those living things die the, um, the, the nitrogen is broken back down uh, into those basic elements that can then be reused again, recycled over time. But again, the source of the nitrogen for the nitrogen cycle is in the uh, nitrogen gas that's in the atmosphere. And again, the same thing is happening on land as in any marine or aquatic ecosystem in general. The phosphorus cycle, um, Again, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are, are three of the main elements that plants need to fulfill their, their growth requirements. The main difference with the, um, the phosphorus cycle is that the source of the phosphorus isn't in the atmosphere, although phosphorus can get in the atmosphere through things like volcanic eruptions. So the ash and things that get up into an atmosphere after a volcano erupts uh, can contain phosphorus. But the primary source of phosphorus is as an element that's in rocks. As those rocks get worn away and broken down from big pieces to smaller and smaller pieces, that phosphorus ultimately dissolves in the soil. And so then once it's dissolved in the soil, it can be taken up by plants. It can be leached into the nearby waterways where it can be used by plants or it can be used by marine organisms. And then when they die, again, it gets cycled back into the soil for other plants to use or back into the ocean sediments where it can be recycled and, and reused again. 
So again, the main difference with phosphorus cycle is, is now the source isn't in the atmosphere, it's down in the actual soil. By following the movement of, of these different um, things, it helps us understand how productive ecosystems can be. Because it's, again, if you don't fertilize a garden at all and you've got real sterile soil, the plants just won't do very well. If you do fertilize the plants, you can have nice productive garden, lots of fruit, lots of good veggies. But you can also over fertilize a garden. Um, or you can have excess of what would normally be a good thing like nitrogen or phosphorus that can create a problem if it's too abundant. So for example, we used to have a tendency maybe in, in agriculture that if a little's good, we'll, we'll just put a lot of fertilizer on our ag land. And what would generally happen is, is a lot of it would actually just run off across the surface and it would flow into the nearest body of water and then eventually out into the oceans. And again, whereas things like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium are, are necessary, when you have too much of it, it actually is really good, but only for certain things. It's really good to help little microorganisms like bacteria and, and, and even things like algae grow, and it really helps them. But the problem is they benefit and they grow like crazy and start really using up the oxygen. And so if you have a pond that's full of algae, and we've all seen little ponds that are just green, we, we refer to it as looking like pea soup, right? What's happened there is, is that algae or, or even the, the microorganisms are doing really well because they've got all of this fertilizer that's run off. Some of that could even be from our lawns. You fertilize your lawn, looks good and green, so I'm going to really fertilize it. And then it runs off and runs into these ponds. And what happens is those living things benefit, but they use so much oxygen that they kill other plants and animals that live in those ponds. And so what we see on, on this image, I apologize, it's really kind of grainy, but, but these circles and, and the darker, the bigger the circle and the, the darker the red are areas of, of dead zones. Now, it, it doesn't mean that the entire eastern seaboard is dead, but there are areas all along the seaboard and the Gulf Coast and even up in the Pacific Northwest and certainly the Bay Area and Southern California, where there are areas that there are dead zones because of urban runoff. Runoff, again, from agriculture, but also runoff from um, uh, you know, lawns and, and um, runoff from manufacturing. So you get these areas that are really productive but then you can get areas that you actually kill because of dumping too much chemicals into them. And so again, it isn't the chemical that kills the living things, it's the nitrogen and phosphorus that over fertilize an area. And then when that area gets over fertilized, it starts benefiting certain things. And those certain things can overwhelm an ecosystem and, and kill everything else. The Chesapeake Bay was such a productive ecosystem that was so important to the East Coast, provided so much of the seafood, clams, oysters, lobsters, you name it, fish, species, all kinds of species of fish. But because of how concentrated the population of humans is, and therefore manufacturing, and, and again, before we understood how things could bio uh, magnify up a food chain. We, we dumped so much into the Chesapeake Bay that we almost sterilized it. Again, we identified the problem. We, we figured out what the source of the problem was and started researching it, started making laws 
that changed the way that we could do things like manufacturing and 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 helping agriculture understand how to how to be more efficient at, at fertilizing but not over fertilizing and and even still now it's been decades that we're still working at restoring that ecosystem the gulf of mexico same exact problem. There, there are huge dead zones where the Mississippi River dumps into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's because the Mississippi runs the entire length of our country, right? From Minnesota all the way down into the Gulf. And there are lots of very big cities along the Mississippi that still are allowed to dump stuff into the Mississippi River. And of course, again, it keeps concentrating and concentrating, and then eventually it's most concentrated when it dumps into the, uh, to the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico. And then the last cycle, the sulfur cycle. Um, again, there is atmospheric sulfur, primarily, again, from, from volcanic eruptions. There are sulfates in the soil that are from rocks and minerals that wear away. And again, we have a cycle from the soil taken up by the plants, plants being eaten by living things. When those living things die, the sulfur is released um, back to the soil or even as a gas. But then again, very importantly, we also have a, a, a huge role in this as humans. And that again, when we burn coal, which is high in so, uh, sulfur, we end up creating sulfur uh, emissions. When that sulfur gets in the atmosphere and it combines with uh, the moisture that's in the atmosphere, we create a weak um, sulfuric acid that creates acid precipitation or, or acid rain. That is, again, an ongoing problem that we're facing um, in the world, not just the U.S., but worldwide acid rain and the, uh, the impacts that it causes is, is a worldwide issue. So, again, there are natural sources of sulfur from volcanic emissions, and that's normal. That's part of the cycle. But, again, it's when these cycles get thrown out of balance, which is almost always by us. Even having huge volcanic eruptions um, usually aren't enough to totally throw an ecosystem out of balance, at least from the standpoint of, you know, sulfur. But when you got billions of people on the planet burning coal, putting way more sulfur into the atmosphere than there should be, that's when you can create imbalances that start really messing up ecosystems. And so the more of us on the planet and the more that we burn fossil fuels, the more our ecosystems are going to be challenged or stretched. So covered a lot of real basic ecological concepts, uh, but very important concepts. Take a, a bit of a step backwards now, back to the biomes. Um, the rest of this chapter now focuses on characteristics of all of those different biomes that we looked at before. Now we're looking at those biomes on a, a world map and where those biomes are located. So again, notice the color coding and where those biomes exist. The kind of interesting or, or the pattern that you might notice here is that, for example, the tropical forests um, are indicated in this green. Notice that they all occur basically um, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. They don't occur when you get closer to either of the poles. And that's because, again, what are the components of that pyramid? Temperature, precipitation, and latitude, right? So you have a certain temperature range when you're near the equator, which is that line, remember. 
And then that means a certain precipitation pattern, right? You've, you're always kind of warm. You're always fairly moist. And then you're, you're within 30 degrees of the equator. And so all of the rainforests are within that belt. Notice on another extreme, the tundra is always on the extreme northern latitudes. The farther you get from the equator, the, the shorter the seasons are, the longer the, the, the winter can be, the colder it's going to be. So shorter growing seasons, plants don't have as long to grow during uh, the time of the year when they can actually grow. So again, notice the, the, the patterns that you have these different communities and they, they tend to be kind of, you know, oriented on the, uh, on the earth within a, a certain latitude. And again, that's because that latitude is driven a lot or drives a lot of the temperature and precipitation that you tend to find. Deserts tend to be at those 30 degree north and 30 degree south latitudes. Again, not right on the line, but, but again, the desert, notice those brown areas are right around the 30 degree north. You know, the southern part of, of uh, the North American continent, northern Africa, and then um, across, you know, parts of Australia, South Africa, and then it's kind of weird, but, but, but a certain part of um, Central America. So I already mentioned that basically when you have a lot of um, productivity, you tend to have a lot of diversity. And so again, that's why the, the tropical rainforest or tropical wet forest that we have uh, have lots of species diversity. The coral reef and the algae beds in the oceans um, tend to have a lot of diversity. And so then as you go from high productivity to low productivity, the diversity decreases. Food chains are shorter. Food webs are simpler than they are when you're in a more productive ecosystem like a, like a tropical rainforest. Um, so I'm not going to go through each ecosystem and, and talk about all of the characteristics. I'll leave that up to you as far as reading uh, this section of the book. So what to focus on? I, again, this might be one of those sections of the book that when you get to a question that asks you something about, say, a, a savanna or um, characteristics of a desert, some of them may be obvious, but these may be the questions that I would just suggest, you know, you, you save time for these to be able to maybe just go look up the answer. Uh, rather than memorizing all of the different characteristics of each of the different biomes. Again, I read through it and make sure you at least have a general sort of visual of what each of these biomes looks like. The type of plants, the type of animal, the, the type of climate, hot, dry, wet, um, you know, moderate, moderate temperatures. Have a general idea. But then again, if there's a specific question, uh, those might be the ones that you, uh, that you need to look up. So chaparral, um, you know, drier than a forest, typically lots of shrubs. And we have chaparral all around the great central valley of California, dominated by manzanita and, and shrubs like that, gray pine, um, some of the oaks, interior live oak. So chaparral is a, a really abundant community in California and a lot of the western United States for that matter. Prairies are dominated by grasses and animals that eat the grasses. A forest is a biome that gets enough precipitation to support trees. If you don't get a lot of precipitation, you can't support big plants. The bigger the plant or the more abundant the plants are, the more precipitation they need to be able to sustain themselves. Grasslands get enough moisture to grow grass. 
chaparral gets enough moisture to also now support shrubs, but not trees or not, not a lot of trees. And then the temperate forest um, gets enough rainfall to support trees. The boreal forest is higher latitude, so like up into southern Canada, but also at the high elevations. Um, less rainfall, more of it's in, uh, more of the precipitation is, is as snow, shorter growing seasons. And now instead of having deciduous trees, you have evergreen trees. They can't afford to waste their energy dropping their leaves every year. They need to conserve their energy because it's a colder climate, more of it's snow, not, not liquid precipitation, short growing season. The tundra, the farther north you get, again, more of the precipitation is snow, short summers, um, but, but you don't see a lot of trees when you get all the way up into the true tundra. And then remember, we also have all of these ecosystems that are aquatic, and we often kind of forget about them because it's easy to see a big redwood tree or it's easy to see, um, you know, deer eating, eating shrubs or whatever. But we don't often see what's underwater. You might if you go to the coast and you're interested in these um, uh, tidal pools. You know, you can see all these starfish and all these other cool things in there. Um, but oftentimes we don't, don't think about them as much because we, we don't see underwater as much. If we look at the ocean, we even break the ocean down into a bunch of different zones. And each of those zones have different characteristics, kind of a, you know, different ecosystems within the big picture, within the big biome. We have intertidal zones where the, where the tides kind of go up and down. Living things in the tidal zones get underwater and then they get exposed, depending on whether the tides up or down. The neuritic zone, the, the zone that's just out from the intertidal zone. The oceanic zone is just the open water out in the ocean. And then within that, we have the, um, the, the photic zone, which is the, the, the depth of water where light penetrates. So you can still have those photosynthetic um, phytoplankton that can photosynthesize and, and be the, the base of the, of the ecology. You get below that the aphotic zone, so, so deeper than the light can penetrate. And the abyssal zone down below 4,000 meters where it's basically open ocean and, um, and pretty limited life. So uh, again, familiarize yourself with these zones. Potentially on a quiz, there could be a, an image like this without the names. And it might say, you know, which zone. It might point to a zone and say, which zone is this? It could do that for the ocean, or it could do it for um, a freshwater ecosystem. So again, um, you make sure you put a little time into studying that and the terminology. But it may also be that you just reference the book if, if some of those questions come up. Of course, coral reefs are very important aquatic ecosystems because of the amount of life they support. And they're also becoming endangered in some ways because of human-caused problems. Uh, and so we're really working hard to protect the coral reefs. Estuaries are also hugely productive ecosystems that provide a lot of food for humans. Estuaries are, are the areas where a freshwater river flows out into the ocean and so you've got a mix of fresh water and salt water and so then you not only have in that area like the, the this image shows the river coming in and meeting the ocean in that area they're really diverse and it should be pretty obvious why you've got certain living things that that exist in fresh water you've got other living things that exist out in the salt water and you have a whole nother group of living things that live in the, the brackish water, which is the term we use when you get a mixture of fresh and salt water. 
So you've got like three different ecosystems coming together, creating, again, a lot of diversity. And again, humans depend a lot on these types of areas for, for food, a lot of different aquatic food sources. I already mentioned the problem with algae blooms, right? Uh, runoff, excess fertilization, creating algae rich environments that also are oxygen poor environments and and then those ecosystems can become starved of oxygen leading to the death of a lot of the fish and things that live in that water so these are ongoing problems pretty much everywhere in this country we have these kinds of problems despite the fact we know it's a problem we know what causes it but we aren't always able just to completely fix the problem. We know even rivers aren't just rivers. There are very shallow, fast-running streams that are cold, that are fed by snow melt, um, that have a lot of oxygen available because the water's moving and bubbling over rocks, and that gets oxygen incorporated into it, to very wide slow moving river systems and again those are those rivers are very different from each other completely different living things different species of fish different aquatic organisms from from the bottom to the top because of the oxygen the temperature the size the depth all of those things make the different size and types of streams support completely different types of life forms. Swamps, uh, marshes, not only have value in that they're kind of a natural flood control mechanism. Swamps and marshes kind of absorb excess rainfall when it runs off. And then it slowly filters that water through the soil and through the organic material. And then releases nice, clean, water as if you'd poured it through a filter. We, we've drained swamps, we've cut trees down, we've destroyed them in the past for, for our benefit to, to harvest the trees, to drain them to grow food. Uh, but now again, it's a, it's a big push to preserve and even try to rebuild swamps because of how important they are not only to the environment, but, but to us, just from the standpoint of they're part of the diversity of the world. And so they're important from an ecological standpoint, again, to absorb excess rainfall, to filter water, take out all the natural impurities. But they're also just part of the bigger picture of creating a diverse planet that supports life. So again, I, I know I went through that part quickly. You know, I, I always half jokingly say that the best way to really study biomes is by renting or, or going on Netflix or Discovery or whatever. BBC typically has Planet Earth, right? I bought the Blu-ray set of the Planet Earth series um, and, and have watched that a whole bunch of times. But the Planet Earth series basically explores all of the biomes on the earth and and looks at all of the diversity and and what makes that biome that biome now again i don't literally expect you to watch the entire planet earth series you know to study chapter 20 but um but that literally is the best way of course i guess really the best way is to go outside and and go in these biomes and, and walk through them and listen to what's out there and, and just pay attention to the plants and animals and enjoy it. Being outside has, has benefits to humans that are spiritual. It could be physical activity, which is good. It could be just something to do to get away from work, to get your mind on something else. Um, and it could be more of a spiritual thing. People go for hikes in the redwoods just because it's calming and it makes you feel good 
if we lose the diversity, we lose some of us a little bit. We lose our ability sort of to be humans, to, to be part of nature and really enjoy it. So ultimately, that's my, my goal is that we, we get outside as much as we can, but, but we also don't just, just, we aren't just outside, but we're paying attention to what's around us when we are outside. We're enjoying the values that nature has. And again, the only way we can enjoy that is if we have it. If we let things go away, if we destroy environments, which we've done a lot of in the past, and we still do, um, the more of it that we can stop the damage and repair it and heal it, um, the better off we're going to be as, as humans going forward. All right, so just two chapters left after this one as the semester starts to wind down. So be looking forward to those last couple of chapters.